Here at the fabulous Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasburg, our story begins. In 18th century America, commerce was at the mercy of wagon transportation. The wagons were flimsy in construction, limited in capacity, slow in movement. And as a result, commerce floundered in the early years of the Republic. Necessity and farsightedness, however, soon led to a heyday of canal construction. Great artificial waterways were built, such as the Erie Canal in New York State and the James River and Kanawha Canal, which stretched 200 miles west of Richmond and connected the state capital uh, with the markets to the Piedmont and beyond. Soon, these builders began to see the advantage of putting steam power on the riverboats and the barges. And it was not too long before men began to visualize the idea of steam power on wheels for overland travel to places that the canals and the rivers could never reach. The idea of harnessing steam to move things was hardly new in the early 1800s. In fact, notions that steam could be somehow used to achieve tasks, to work, went back more than a thousand years to the ancient Greeks and perhaps even the ancient Egyptians who had devised systems of harnessing steam to open the gigantic doors of their temples, which of course visited great wonderment on their congregations who saw no hands opening these doors, but rather they thought they just miraculously opened on their own. By the late 1700s, when steam began to be harnessed to steam boats, it was only a matter of time before someone was going to try to apply this same industry to moving things on land. And coincidentally, on both sides of the Atlantic, in about 1825, two men, George Stevenson in England and John Stevens here in America, came up with roughly the same idea, though they achieved it by very different means. Stevenson, in England, was looking for a way to get coal efficiently and quickly out of the collieries, and so he came up with a locomotive that would haul the wagons of coal up out of the mines. But here in America, in Hoboken, New Jersey, John Stevens, who had already worked with John Fitch in developing his early steamboats, designed this, which he didn't even name. And it certainly had no commercial application because he only operated it on a one-half mile circular track in his backyard in Hoboken. But it was the first American steam locomotive. Simple, crude, yet it could move on land. And it was from such almost naive origins as this that the great American railroad industry began. Within just a few short years after John Stevens built his crude steam wagon, engines like the John Bull began to be seen on the American landscape. Built in 1831 in Newcastle in England, but shipped over here for a railroad in New Jersey, this already in 1831 is recognizable as the locomotive of the future, the firebox, the steam boiler, the smokestack, all the elements that are going to be recognizable throughout American folklore and culture as the powerful steam locomotive that's going to drive America for the next century. America's Industrial Revolution exploded in the 1830-1860 period. It is no coincidence at all that railroad growth skyrocketed at the same time. After all, the manufacture of goods and the transportation of manufactured goods went hand to hand. A single decade will illustrate the growth. In 1850, there were 9,000 miles of railroads in America. Ten years later, that had grown to 31,000 miles of railroad, and it was still growing when Civil War came. The South lagged far behind. Not merely did it have only one-third of the railroad mileage, it had only one-fifth of the railroad workers. The lines were cheaply constructed and shoddily maintained so that the South was ill-prepared to handle the great volume of traffic necessary to wage a successful war. Railroads made transportation more abundant as well as cheaper. It also made the transportation of people and goods much faster, incredibly so. In the age of wagons, it took 50 days to travel from New York to Cincinnati. With the railroads, the trip could be made in five days. And those cities which stood alongside railroad tracks enjoyed tremendous prosperity. Take Chicago, for example. In 
During the 1850s, 15 railroads converged on the city of Chicago. In that same decade, its population increased by 375%. Verily, a new age had dawned with the coming of the Iron Horse. The D-16 class of the Pennsylvania Railroad represented the ultimate development of the American type steam locomotive. Although the design was refined and enlarged greatly over the years, its basic elements and operation remained largely unchanged. A fire in the firebox was used to generate heat, warming water in the surrounding water jacket and boiler to create steam. As the steam naturally rose to the top, it was harnessed in the steam dome where the throttle could be opened by the engineer directing the steam from the boiler down to the two main pistons at the front of the engine. The expansion of the steam inside the pistons worked back and forth on these main side rods, turning the wheels and propelling the locomotive. Once used to push that valve open and closed in the piston, the steam was exhausted through the smoke box and out the smokestack, creating a vacuum in the smoke box to pull hot air and gases from the firebox forward through the boiler, keeping everything working nice and hot and efficiently. In the early days of railroading, even the most basic of designs, things like the track gauge, the distance between the two rails, had yet to be standardized. Now, there were many efforts made by state and local governments to try and legally standardize the, the rail gauge, in some cases mandating for a standard, in other cases actually arguing for separate gauges entering the town from both ends to force the companies to use the town for an interchange and to re help regulate the flow of interstate commerce. In the end, the legislatures, despite their best efforts, were put out by the overall need of the industry to standardize and to interchange with themselves to create longer and more flexible systems of travel. During the time of the Civil War, we came to arrive at what we now call American Standard Gauge, being four feet, eight and one half inches between the rail. The historical data for how we got to four feet, eight and a half inches is a rather interesting and long and convoluted story. Many argue that it actually harkens all the way back to the days of the Roman chariots, where ruts were created in the road by the gauge of those wheels. And then as time went on, those ruts became the, the, the new gauge of standard for all future wagons and eventually railroads themselves. And while it's a very interesting and colorful story, the historical evidence to suggest that it goes back quite that far is rather hard to come by. In fact, most railroads in this country in the beginning were built to a variety of gauges, anywhere from two feet to broader than five feet. And ultimately, at least in America, it was the companies that grew the largest and the fastest and interchanged with each other the quickest that set that new standard. Of course, it was inevitable that this new Leviathan would be turned to military purposes whenever the opportunity presented itself. From the time of the invention of the locomotives, several years went by before there was a military conflict that might take advantage of their potential. Our war with Mexico in the 1840s was fought on foreign soil where there were no roads to use. In the war in the Crimea in 1854 to 56, the British and French did construct a short line railroad from the port at Balaclava to bring supplies to their troops besieging Sebastopol. But the real demonstration of the potential of the railroad in warfare came in what is now the largely forgotten Franco-Austrian War of 1859. It was a brief affair. It lasted merely three months, but it was very bloody. The Italian patriot Cavour had for some years been anticipating such a conflict, and he had begun a program of building railroads in the Piedmont. The French, of course, had been building railroads at a fast pace, with the result that when the Austrians invaded, in the late spring of 1859, the French and the Piedmontese railroads were in place and the French army was able to transport 128,000 soldiers quickly to the front in time to deliver two crushing blows to the Austrians and to win the war and to show the future what the railroad could do. Warfare was ready to ride the rails. standing at a reconstructed locomotive assembly line at the Southern Locomotive and Civil War Museum in Kennesaw, Georgia. And as you can see behind me, those locomotives came in various sizes back then. 
In 1860, the United States had 30,000 miles of railroad track. However, only 9,000 of those miles was in the South, and that was but the start of the discrepancy. Uh, in 1860, of 470 locomotives produced in America, only 19 came from the South. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad alone had 1,200 more cars than all of Virginia's railroads combined. The South had traditionally purchased its locomotives from the North and England, but both markets are cut off because of the war. Hence, the Confederacy must make do with what it has. And from the very beginning, it has an insufficient number of engines and the heavy hand of war will press down even harder. Thus, the story of the Southern Confederacy is really the story of an ultimate erosion of railroad stock, of the trains trying to do so much and not able to do much of anything. The Southern railroads, or lack of them, will be an ultimate cause of the defeat of the Confederacy, and it gave rise to a now famous phrase, victory, load the rails. Civil War came. Washington, D.C., the northern capital, was totally undefended, except for a single rail line that ran southward from Baltimore, and the capital needed soldiers badly. On April 19th, a week after the firing on Fort Sumter, the 6th Massachusetts arrived in Baltimore. Because of the differences in gauges of railroads of that day, it was necessary for the 6th Massachusetts to disembark from one train and march across town to the other. As it was moving through the downtown, a crowd gathered. It grew larger and more hostile. Curses came forward, and soon people were throwing stones. Then a shot rang out, and a full riot ensued. By the time police calmed it down, four soldiers were dead, 36 were wounded. At least 12 civilians had been killed. For a week thereafter, Southern sympathizers in the Baltimore area uh, carried out a form of espionage by tearing up bridges, neutralizing the rail lines, and the like. Mr. Lincoln was in a quandary. He knew, for example, that soldiers were not moles, they could not travel underground, nor were they birds that could fly overhead. Soldiers had to move by land. Consequently, the president ordered basically martial law in the Baltimore area as well as on the rail line leading southward. And thereafter, solely because of the importance of one rail line, Eastern Maryland was under military occupation. In June 1861, with the Civil War only two months old, Union troops began moving into the northern end of the Shenandoah Valley. The Confederate commander there, General Joseph Johnston, felt that the valuable Baltimore and Ohio Railroad shops at Martinsburg should be destroyed to prevent their use by the enemy. So Johnston dispatched Colonel Thomas J. Jackson and a detachment of men to go to Martinsburg and basically wreck the place. This went against Jackson's judgment because he felt that anything useful should be saved for use by his own forces. Nevertheless, Jackson obeyed orders. Some 56 locomotives and 305 railroad cars were destroyed. Then Jackson's judgment overcame obedience to orders. Jackson summoned two railroad engineers and they found about a dozen locomotives that had not been permanently disabled. Jackson ordered them dismantled, placed on wagons and with 40 horse teams uh, pulling the load, he moved those pieces of locomotives through Martinsburg some 38 miles to the railhead at Strasburg. The pieces of the engines were then taken to Richmond, reassembled and put to good use by the Confederate government. This was the first time in history a commander had dismantled a locomotive to remove its pieces elsewhere and reassemble them for further use. Incidentally, the president of the Baltimore and Ohio was a man named Garrett. He was a strong Southern sympathizer. He always considered to be an old, a Southern line. Initially, he referred to the Confederates as uh, my Southern friends, 
uh, the destruction of his line began, they were my misguided friends. And by the time Stonewall Jackson got through with the railroad, Garrett was calling the Southerners those damned rascals. In a war involving the movement of uncountable hundreds of thousands of men and literally millions of tons of freight, communications were going to be vital. Communications had come a long way in the early years of the 19th century prior to the Civil War. Of course, the railroad itself saw its birth in 1825, and less than 20 years later, the telegraph came along. And the two were suited for each other almost from the first. Indeed, by the 1850s, most of the nation's telegraph lines actually ran along the rail track, and they quickly became intimately associated for timing among other reasons, because as a train passed through a station, the telegrapher there would pass on the word to the next station that the train had just come and they could estimate when it was going to reach the next station to guard against interference running into other trains in the opposite direction, that sort of thing. It was a very, very complex system, yet largely worked very effectively. So that by 1860, there were nearly 2,000 professional telegraphers in the country. And interestingly enough, perhaps 100 to 200 of them were women because it was discovered that the fine, detailed handwork required in operating the key was well suited to the nature of a woman's hands. And of course, as the war came on and more and more men were drafted into the military, women had to take over for men in a whole variety of functions. When the war began, Thomas Scott in Washington was put in charge of U.S. military railroads and telegraphs, and he very quickly called on his associate, Andrew Carnegie, the future philanthropist and industrialist, and asked him to organize the United States' military telegraph system, which he did with brilliant organizational skill, revealing why he was later to become such a great industrialist. Before long, he had nearly 2,000 men working for him as telegraphers, as military telegraphers, throughout the country. It's important to keep in mind that while the telegraph was a remarkable communications device for its time, it was not the instantaneous communication that we think of today. The batteries in use to transfer the electronic signals weren't powerful enough to drive the signals more than a few miles at a time. The result being that a telegram from Washington had to be relayed from one telegrapher to another all across the railroad lines before it could reach, say, St. Louis. Still, a message could have go from Washington to St. Louis in a matter of several hours, which was a dramatic improvement over the old mail system but it was not quite as instantaneous as we think of it being today. But the importance of that, of the telegraph operating in tandem with the railroad cannot be overestimated in the impact it was going to have on the Union war effort. Things could run on time. Plans could be made to coordinate operations. In this first and most modern of all 19th century wars, technology, timing and efficiency, and imagination were all going to come together. The South had one military advantage in railroads at the beginning of the war. Fighting defensively, its lines were shorter, hence transportation would seem to be faster from one point to another. Seemingly, this was so. In mid-July 1861, General Joseph E. Johnston and a large Confederate force were stationed in Winchester. They were suddenly ordered to head east with all dispatch toward Manassas Junction, where a Federal army was threatening a force there. Johnston got his men on board the Manassas Gap Railroad. At least he got his first contingent on. This was 3,600 Virginia soldiers under General Thomas J. Jackson. They made the trip without incident. The train simply moving 30 miles down there, unloading, coming back and loading up again. Once Jackson's men were there, however, Johnston began to encounter all sorts of obstacles, a train crews of suspect loyalties, an occasional derailment, massive disorganization. In short, the whole transfer was badly planned and clumsily executed. It almost cost the Confederacy a victory at the First Battle of Manassas. Herman Haup is not a familiar figure in Civil War history. He should be. Born in Philadelphia, he was the youngest cadet ever to graduate from West Point. He served only a brief time in the Army, then resigned because he had become fascinated with a new form of transportation called the railroad. 
and by 1860 he was the most famous railroad construction engineer in the world. Early in 1862 he agreed to become superintendent of all military railroads in the North, not because it was a lucrative offer, but because it was a challenge. And indeed it was. Things were a mess. Traffic bottlenecks were everywhere. Poor management at all levels has resulted in trains being sent to the wrong depot and by circuitous routes. And when those trains finally reached their destinations, they usually were placed on sidings or on the main line where they sat for days on end. One horrible example of that confusion came in August 1862 with General John Pope's army in Virginia. His horses were dying in the harness from starvation and yet 78 railroad cars loaded with grain stood idly on a siding less than a day's march away. Small wonder that Haupt became contemptuous of the military. He demanded civilian control of the railroads and he got it. He usually refused to wear a uniform though he held a colonel's rank in the army. But he attacked his problem with characteristic intensity and attention to detail. And almost overnight uh, organization replaced indifference. Tight control took the place of loose confusion. And the railroads became one of the North's most powerful weapons in the Civil War. Railroads were the land monsters of that day. Keeping them moving in wartime was a real challenge, but it was a challenge that Herman Hauck faced head on. Barely a week after taking charge of the military railroads, how it began to repair the line between Alexandria and Fredericksburg. Soon there loomed before him the deep gorge of Potomac Creek. How it had 120 soldiers, not rail workers, no timber of the type used in bridge buildings, insufficient tools, but he had to get a bridge built. And so he set his men to work, chopping down local trees, doing the best they could under terrible circumstances. And the circumstances were terrible. It was raining. The mud was getting deeper each day, and Confederate snipers across the way were picking off a worker now and then. In an incredible nine days, Haupt completed the work with unskilled workers, green timber, and hand tools. And the trestle itself was 80 feet high, 400 feet long. President Lincoln visited the bridge. He returned to Washington and said this to his cabinet. I have seen the most remarkable structure human eyes ever rested upon. That man, Haupt, has built a bridge 400 feet long over which loaded trains are running every hour. And upon my word, gentlemen, there is nothing in the bridge but bean poles and corn stalks. One man of ingenuity paying tribute to another. The extent of Herman Haupt's genius with military railroads will never be known. In the autumn of 1863, he became embroiled with the government over an issue and resigned angrily from the army. After the war, he became a leading spirit in the creation of the Southern Railway System, which extended basically from Washington to New Orleans. He died of a heart attack just before Christmas 1905. Appropriately, he was riding a train at the time of his death. Just as in the North, railroads in the Confederacy were a business. It was about making money. The whole Confederate ethic, the whole Southern ethic, rebelled against centralization. That's part of the reason for secession in the first place. With the result that when the war came, despite repeated efforts to centralize control of the Confederacy's railroads, the individual companies and the politicians from the individual states resisted almost to the end of the war. The result was taking a system that was already somewhat chaotic and making it even more so. Very few railroads or track line were actually built during the course of the war. There was no coordination to what was done. Richmond tried to apply a little bit of initial control, but it was always doomed. A man named William Ashe in 1861 was put in charge of coordinating just Virginia's railroads. That's as far as the government was willing to go. But within less than a year, Ashe was so frustrated at the lack of cooperation from the railroads and the lack of cooperation from the government that he simply stepped aside. He was replaced by a man named William Wadley, who had a fair bit more success, but Wadley too would be frustrated in the end. Every time legislation was introduced in Congress to mandate some kind of military control of the railroads, it would be talked down 
and ultimately defeated or so diluted as to be pointless. There were definite needs to have some kind of control. For instance, simple things like train schedules between one line and another didn't exist. Nowhere was there a schedule that would show what time a train could leave New Orleans and passengers or freight might ultimately arrive in Richmond because of all the several different lines they were going to have to travel on. There was no coordination of the management of freight cars. Worse, what little control there was was put in the hands of individual quartermasters of the several military departments. And what they quickly found was that when a trainload of supplies reached one quartermaster, he didn't just keep the supplies, he used the freight cars as storage units, which meant these cars were sitting there idle without being available for use to take more supplies somewhere else. Congress did create a railroad bureau, but then they almost hamstrung its ability to accomplish anything by making it subservient to the quartermaster department. So they virtually compromised any hope they had of getting any good out of it. William Wadley would eventually be just as frustrated as his predecessor, and he would be dismissed to be replaced by Frederick Sims, who would stay in control of the Railroad Bureau up to the end of the war. Finally, in February 1865, with the situation so desperate that there were no alternatives left, Congress did, at last, enact stringent railroad legislation that authorized the government to seize railroads, to take control of their cars, to enroll railroad employees as enlisted members of the military so that they would be under the authority of the Confederate military establishment. But the measure was far too little and of course it came far too late. The Confederacy may never have had a chance of winning its independence. Certainly the Confederate railroad system never had any hope at all of standing up in a competition against that system that was already in place in the Union as of 1861 and that was further advanced and enhanced by the brilliant work of Herman Haupt. For the Confederacy, as in so many other areas, railroading was a case of making do with what little they had and depending as much as anything on hope. Late in March 1862, General U.S. Grant and a major Union army advanced southward through western Tennessee. One of Grant's objectives was to sever the vital, all-important East-West Railroad in the Confederacy. It extended from Chattanooga to Memphis. Meanwhile, on the other side of Tennessee, a second Union force was preparing to strike southward. It was under the command of a college professor turned soldier named General Ormsby Mitchell. Mitchell's objective was Huntsville, Alabama. Only 30 miles west of Chattanooga, Huntsville had railroad yards, shops, at least 15 locomotives, and the general offices of the railroad. However, Mitchell was quite aware that as he advanced southward toward uh, Huntsville, moving into Alabama, he was exposing his left flank to possible attack. And indeed, he had cause to worry because on his left, the Confederates controlled Chattanooga, the Confederates controlled Atlanta, and the Con Confederates controlled the 138-mile rail line connecting the two cities. Therefore, to protect his flank, and possibly to loosen up Chattanooga's defenses and make it more vulnerable to attack, Ormsby Mitchell devised a bold but highly dangerous plan. On April the 12th, 1862, one of the most exciting escapades of the American Civil War happened not more than 100 yards from this very spot. James J. Andrews, a paid Yankee spy with 24 men, had worked his way over 200 miles behind the Confederate lines. Their objective was to burn the bridges, tear up the communications, and tear up the track on the Western Atlantic Railroad. This Georgia-owned railroad was very important to the Confederacy. The supplies and equipment from Georgia were making their way up to Chattanooga. From Chattanooga, they could go east on the Memphis and Charleston Railroad, feeding the Army of the Confederacy in Richmond. On the left hand, they could feed the Army in Mississippi. This line was very, very important to the Confederacy. It was thought by some in the Union Army that if this line was destroyed, it could shorten the war by two years. It was a good plan that ended very badly for James J. Andrews. The next morning, Andrews and his raiders boarded the train, the general, at the Marietta Depot. 
An hour later, at the Big Shanty breakfast stop at the Lacey Hotel, while the Confederate crew went in to eat, James J. Andrews and his men stole the locomotive. Right across the street was the camps of Camp McDonald, a training camp for the Confederates. Over 3,000 men watched helplessly as the Yankees stole the train. A mile down the road, Andrews stops, gets some tools from a work crew. He has three boxcars on the back of his locomotive. His story is that he has a special powder train for General Beauregard in Memphis. Very believable story. The Battle of Shiloh had just been fought a few days before this. He would use this story several times on his raid north. Down the road they stopped, had a man shimmy up the telegraph pole, cut the telegraph line, and tore up a track. When they came to Cartersville, they found a small engine sitting there at the bridge at the Etowah River. Cooper Ironworks owned this locomotive. Andrew's engineer, William Knight, suggested to him that he should tear up this bridge and destroy that engine. Andrews did not want to tip his hand too quick. He moved on. At Kingston, Georgia, they found the track congested with engines. Mitchell had moved upon Huntsville and had put a scare in the Confederates in Chattanooga. The Confederates in Chattanooga had loaded everything they could get going and rolled it down to Atlanta to get out of, out of harm's way. Andrews was blocked at Kingston for over an hour and five minutes. Back at the Lacey Hotel, William Fuller is very surprised to see his train moving down the track without him. Him, Jeff Kane, and Anthony Murphy take off on foot after the locomotive of the general. Go down the road and they find a pole car. They pole all the way to Cartersville, Georgia, to the Etowah Bridge, where they find the little engine, the Yona, sitting there. They commandeer the engine, make it to Kingston, and when they get to Kingston, the people at Kingston tell them, you've missed the general by four minutes. Fuller's mad as a wet hen, somebody stole his engine. He runs down the road and finds an engine called the William R. Smith, commandeers it. He rides on the front of the pilot to make sure that there's no more rails pulled up. Two miles down the road, they find a rail pulled up. Now they're on foot again. Two miles below Adairsville, Georgia, Pete Bracken in the locomotive Texas pull up. Explains to Fuller that he just passed the general. They put the Texas in reverse. For 57 miles, the locomotive Texas chases the general. Every time the Yanks stop to get wood and water, the Confederates are right on their tail. At Tunnel Hill, the Yankees speed through the tunnel. Pete Bracken sees the color of the smoke coming out of the tunnel and says, boys, we have them now. He, he realizes the locomotive general is about out of steam. Two miles above Ringo, the Yankees abandon their engine. Andrews tells every man, fan for himself. In Ringo, Georgia, they just happened to be having a militia meeting that day. Fuller takes advantage of this, tells the officers at the militia meeting that he needs some help to find the men who stole his train. Andrews Raiders were all captured within about 10 days. They were all put in a jail in Chattanooga. Andrews was tried as a spy and found guilty in Chattanooga. This has been called the greatest espionage story to come out of the American Civil War. Because the Andrews Raiders were wearing civilian clothing, they were charged as spies rather than captured enemy soldiers and indicted on the capital crime of espionage. On June 18, 1862, seven of them were hanged from a single scaffold in downtown Atlanta. Even by the standards of that day, it was a botched execution. But when the scaffold dropped, the ropes around two of the men broke and they fell to the ground. And there they sat while their five comrades dangled in the air. And then they too were taken back up and hanged. A few months later, the United States Congress, in an effort to recognize the extraordinary valor and sacrifice being shown by these civilian soldiers of the North, created the Medal of Honor which remains the highest award this nation can give to one of its sons or daughters. <laughs>
After the executions of Captain Andrews and seven of his raiders, they were buried in Atlanta. However, in 1891, the federal government moved the remains here to the Chattanooga National Cemetery in a special plot underneath the shadow of Lookout Mountain. For 140 years, historians have sought in vain to learn something about the individuals who were the Union soldiers involved in Andrews' raid. The recent discoveries of the letters of one of them provide a very intimate picture of him as a soldier. His name was Samuel Slavens. He lies appropriately next to Captain Andrews. Slavens was an Ohio farmer in his early 30s. He had a wife and three small sons. In October 1861, he enlisted in the army out of a sense of duty and feelings of patriotism. And in his letters home, however, it is quite clear that while his head was in the army, his heart was at home. On April 4th, he had volunteered for a secret mission, and he sent a letter to his wife. It was to be his last letter. And toward the end of it, as if he had a premonition that things were not going to go well, he wrote this postscript to his wife. I don't want to give you any uneasiness any more than you can help about me, but if anything happens to me that we never meet again on earth, I hope we will meet in heaven. Life is uncertain in war. Train up our babies the way they should go. Give them all the education you can. I would like to be there to help you to take care of them, the best in the world. But all I can do is wish you well and think of you, which is often. One of Herman Haupt's greatest achievements involved this particular railroad. Late in June 1863, the Union Army gathered at the small village of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to do battle. Haupt quickly looked at his maps and discovered that there was no railroad up there. And so he quickly put his forces together and began around-the-clock labor, men laying track, uh, constructing fuel depots, erecting water towers, buying rolling stock from one railroad to another. And the result was that the Union Army at Gettysburg was being supplied with no less than 1,500 tons of supplies each day flowing along this track out of Baltimore heading for Gettysburg. The trains were not returning empty, however. Haupt made sure that the trains coming back for supplies carried the human debris from Gettysburg. And no fewer than 15,400 sick and wounded soldiers were taken eastward to the hospitals at Baltimore and Washington. Soldiers who might well have died at Gettysburg in the primitive sanitary conditions there. It was truly a wonder that he had performed. The value of railroads in the Civil War is just multitudinous. Here at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, we are sitting in a contemporary car, passenger car of that age. In mid-September 1863, General James Longstreet's first corps from the Army of Northern Virginia was ordered to reinforce the Western Confederate Army. The logical route would have been 550 miles through Knoxville. However, Union's forces occupied Knoxville, and so Longstreet was forced to take his men by an incredible roundabout method involving 900 miles over a dozen different railroads, and yet the 12,000 men would make that trip successfully in 10 days. It was a transportational wonder. It did not all go smoothly, however. At one point, for example, two trains collided on the Western and Atlantic line, killing almost 100 soldiers. At one point on that long, tedious trip, a conductor had the affrontery to demand a fire from the soldiers on board. One soldier aimed his musket at the conductor and said, I paid my fire at Gettysburg. After that long 900-mile rail trip, all done again, remember, in 10 days, Longstreet's chief of staff wrote this, Never before were so many troops moved over such worn-out roads. Never before were such crazy cars used for such good soldiers. Quite coincidentally, perhaps the two greatest feats of Civil War railroading both took place in relation to the fall campaign in Northeast Georgia. Of course, the transfer of James Longstreet's Corps from Virginia out to take part in the Battle of Chickamauga, helping turn the tide of battle 
was a big event for the Confederacy. But then immediately afterward, the demoralized Union Army withdrew into Chattanooga, where it was to be besieged. Yet it was not so demoralized that it wasn't ready to stand and fight if it could be supported. Charles Dana, a War Department operative, telegraphed on September 23rd to Washington that if reinforcements could be sent, the Union Army in Chattanooga could hold out. And then an incredible operation took place. Within 48 hours, the first elements of the 11th and 12th Corps under General Joseph Hooker were put on trains in Washington and sent west. Four days later, the advance elements began to arrive in Louisville. In just 12 days, more than 20,000 troops, 10 batteries of artillery, and 100 wagons of supplies had moved over 1,200 miles from Washington by rail all the way to Bridgeport, Alabama, just 30 miles from Chattanooga, where they stood poised to help raise the siege. Throughout the first stages of the Civil War, both sides used cavalry to stage raids on the other side's rail lines. But by 1864, generals such as Grant and Sherman saw that merely defeating the enemy's army was not enough. You've got to break the enemy's capacity to fight. And hence they declared war on railroads, if you will. Indeed, on Sherman's famous march to the sea, going from Atlanta to Savannah, 1,000 Union soldiers were detailed each day for the single task of destroying five miles of railroad. Five days, 100 miles destroyed. Both sides began to use methods that were tested in true. A well-aimed cannonball through the boiler rendered a locomotive unusable. Two powder charges strategically placed would knock out a bridge. But the key thing was to take up the rails. That was the simplest way uh, to neutralize a railroad. Not only would they take up the rails, but they would place the rails over a pile of blazing cross ties and melt down the middle of it, the rail, until it became malleable. Then they would bend the rail around the tree. When the rail cooled, it was useless. The Union also developed a system and a mechanism by which they not only bent the rails, but they twisted them, uh, which then made the rails totally unusable no matter what sort of repairs you tried to make. In short, by the time the Union armies got through, most of the southern lines were simply scrap iron and ashes. While certainly the railroads had some spectacular, dramatic successes in the large-scale movement of troops from one theater of war to the other, it was the everyday work on the rails that really kept the war moving. More than five million tons of supplies were hauled by the U.S. Military Railroad in the course of the war. We don't know how much was hauled by Confederate lines during that same period of time. One of the most spectacular of their achievements, and, and little heralded, was connected to William T. Sherman's fabled Atlanta campaign and, and the campaign on to the sea. Sherman built up a massive supply depot in Chattanooga, Tennessee, prior to launching his campaign on Atlanta. And then he had one railroad line available to him, it had been torn up by the Confederates as they retreated, so Sherman's military engineers had to keep rebuilding the line as they advanced forward. And all along the way, every day, that line provided train load after train load of ammunition, military supplies, food, reinforcements. That one railroad eventually snaked more than 470 miles south through Atlanta and on for some distance toward the sea. Trains would go in convoys of four at a time 1,600 tons of supplies were moved every single day to Sherman's army along that line, keeping his men fed, keeping them supplied for battle, and keeping them on the road to victory. The most vital element in Southwest Virginia during the Civil War was the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad. Of course, the area was full of natural necessary resources for war, coal, iron, lead, salt, but how to get those ingredients from the mines to the battlefront was the job of the V&T Railroad. The line had been completed in the mid-1850s. It was the longest railroad in Virginia. It stretched from Lynchburg all the way to Bristol. It was also the biggest railroad in that it had a whopping five-foot wide gauge and it which had to bear the heaviest locomotives in the nation. In those days, cross ties and rails were simply laid upon the ground, but the V&T was too heavy 
and as a consequence it became the first railroad in the Western Hemisphere to use stone ballast as a bed. During the war, the railroad suffered, as all of them did, from poor equipment, lack of funds, etc. In addition, federal troops on at least three occasions severed the line and did great damage. By war's end, the V&T existed almost in the history books. One simple sad statistic can be given. Along those 204 miles that comprised the railroad, one station was still standing when Lee surrendered at Appomattox. On the night of April 2nd and 3rd, 1865, Robert E. Lee abandoned the Petersburg lines. His original intent was to proceed southwest along the Richmond and Danville Railroad and then link up with General Joseph E. Johnston's Confederate forces somewhere along the Virginia-North Carolina line. But Grant's pursuing army was persistent and soon Union cavalry got astride the R&D Railroad at Jetersville. This forced Lee to veer from southwest to west-northwest and to head along the route of the Southside Railroad toward Lynchburg, where hopefully he would make a secure to sweep around, head southward and, and link with Johnston. Grant had ordered all the railroad bridges burned to hamper the Confederate retreat. And this produced one of the last major battles of the war, fought April 6th for control of High Bridge a rather incredible structure, 2,400 feet long, 125 feet high, resting on 12 brick pillows. Spirited fighting occurred on April 6th, a, a fight in which the Confederates amazingly won the battle. Uh, they burned four spans of the bridge before retreating westward to rejoin Lee's army. By April 9th, Lee had reached Appomattox Courthouse, and there he learned the worst. Pursuing Union forces were not only on his flanks, but they had gotten in his front. Lee had nowhere to go. And so on Sunday afternoon, April 9th, 1865, in the front parlor of Wilma McLean's farmhouse here at Appomattox, Lee and Grant agreed to terms of surrender. The Civil War, for all practical purposes, was over at this quiet spot. Years before the coming of the war, the railroad had already come to symbolize hellos and goodbyes in American life. The tracks brought hundreds of thousands of young men off to war. When the fighting was done, it took those who were alive back home. Yet still it had one remaining function, and that was to help Americans with remembrance. Abraham Lincoln had died before the war was even over. Shot on April 14th and died on April 15th. And a week later, his journey home began. A journey that was heavily orchestrated, it was in part a political media event and a part a natural outpouring of sympathy and grief over the loss of a beloved Father Abraham. For two weeks, the Lincoln funeral train snaked its way northward and then westward through Baltimore, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, New York, on to Cleveland and Chicago, taking the president past hundreds of thousands who would see him in the cities and past untold other numbers of Americans who simply gathered by the tracks in fields and at country junctions to watch the train go past to give them an opportunity to say goodbye to their martyred president. 28 years later another president died. In December 1889 in New Orleans Jefferson Davis met his death. Within hours of his passing there was a competition among a half a dozen Confederate states each wanting to host the final resting place of the man who had led the Confederacy in life and after death. Inevitably, of course, Virginia and Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, was going to get the Confederate president in the end. Three years later, Jefferson Davis began his last train journey to his final resting place. Ironically enough, the train that was to take him east to Richmond was donated by the Richmond and Danville Railroad, the very same line that had conveyed Davis and his vanquished government on their last journey out of Richmond as they fled the advancing federal armies. All along the way, in Mobile, Montgomery, Alabama, in Atlanta and elsewhere, the Davis coffin was taken off the train for very brief viewing by thousands who gathered to say their last respects and then put back on the train again. Where Lincoln's last journey took two weeks, Davis's took three days. And by May 31st, 1893, Davis had reached his final resting place in Richmond. Victory may have ridden the rails in the Civil War, but memory rode those rails as well. And the rail lines played a vital role 
in the nation's last farewells to two men who had led portions of that nation in the most cataclysmic events in its life. Throughout this hour, we have stressed the importance of railroads in the American Civil War. After all, the first major battle of the war was fought over control of a railroad junction called Manassas. In similar fashion, the war would end over control of another railroad, and it would end at a place called Appomattox Station and Appomattox Courthouse. That was not coincidence. In this first of the modern wars, it was as it should have been. In the 1860s, railroads changed the entire picture of warfare. They not only introduced long-distance movement of great masses of soldiers and supplies, they also did so at unheard-of speeds and in spite of all kinds of weather. In bringing revolutionary dimensions to military strategy and tactics, rail lines were the key to victory to those generals who made use of them. But that is only part of the evolution. In the post-war years, America ceased to have wide stretches of empty wilderness because of railroad lines snaking hither and yon. Having demonstrated its value in war, the Iron Horse galloped forward in the future to lead a reunited nation to new and grander horizons. Don Piedmont was Director of Public Relations for the Norfolk Southern Railroad before he became chairman of the board of Blue Ridge Public Television. He was a catalyst in the guiding light behind these Civil War documentaries. Actively involved in the first two episodes, he had took a very keen interest in the production of all the others. Don crossed over the river while this episode was being filmed. It seemed so appropriate, owing to his love of railroads and Civil War history, that this installment be dedicated to him but a better reason for doing so is that to all of us involved in the making of these documentaries, Don was a friend in every sense of the word. He will always be missed with gratitude and with affection. <laughs>